They're saying Whitney is using designs off of Alibaba and selling them at like 10, 20 times the price and using the same stock photos and stuff like that. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's your girl, the Brooke Ashley. And today we are here to discuss The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City season five episodes three and four and may i just say mary cosby is a complete delight i am enjoying her so much she's a lot happier i love how she's fully engaging she's having a good time on this trip she's talking she's playful there just seems to be a different spirit and i'm loving her a lot because if you've watched me you know that since the beginning i was not the biggest mary fan I thought she could be rude, cynical, antisocial, but season five, she's done a complete 180. I get the impression that Bravo tapped her on the shoulder and said, now look, Miss Mamas, if you want to be back on full time, you better engage. And when I tell you she's done just that, her head is in the game and I am here for it. Now, Miss Bronwyn, the way you gathered Lisa and Heather up at the end of episode three, I said, come through. You did that so effortlessly. I think I'm starting to like you. But like I said, I'm going to give you until episode five to make my final assessment. But so far, so good. Now, Heather, Lisa, Whitney, and Meredith, I'm going to have to get on y'all because you guys are all trying it in different ways. And Brittany, for the last and final time, that man is not your man. You look ridiculous. And you carried on about it in both episodes. I said, my God, at your big grown age, crying about a man who isn't yours. But y'all, these were great episodes. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And without further ado, let's just get right on into it because you guys already know that we don't have a minute to spare. Now, a quick disclaimer, since this is a double recap, I will not be going over every single scene, okay? We have four Housewives shows on, so I gotta make every minute count. So if I don't mention a certain scene, just we'll talk about it down below in the comments, all right? So we open up episode three with all the women packing for the trip to Milwaukee, and we all know that Whitney is hosting this trip. So we cut to Mary at home, and while she's packing, she calls up Whitney. She's like, look, Whitney, I know that you have a private jet, but I'm not trying to be on that jet with all y'all and your personalities and all that going on, so I'm going to fly by myself. So Whitney says, well, thank you for calling me and telling me if this were anybody else, I would be upset, but it's you, so I'm not going to be angry, it's fine. Now I said, Whitney, just be happy that Mary is coming. <laughs> That's all you can ask for. <laughs> but you know it's bad when somebody's turning down the private plane to fly commercial because they're not trying to be around the drama. <laughs> Oh, one more thing. In this episode, we finally get the taglines, and I think that Mary, Lisa, Angie K, and Bronwyn had the best taglines. Let me know who you guys felt had the best taglines, but yeah, the four of them, those are my favorites. But anyhow, we now jump to Angie K at home, and as she's packing for the trip, she's talking to her husband, Sean. So I was about to write this scene off because truthfully, I don't really care to see Angie and her husband talk about the drama in the group, right? But Angie, the way you surprised me, because we find out some tea that Angie K's brow girl has been receiving DMs from Britney's situationship, her man who's not her man, Jared Osmond. So they show the DMs and he's like, oh, hi, my name is Jared Osmond. I think you're so pretty. Are you single? Can I get your number? And he is really liking Angie's brow girl a lot. And now Angie says that she feels torn because Britney is a sweet woman and she's not trying to hurt her feelings by telling her that her boyfriend is sliding into her brow girl's DMs. Now I said, Angie, the only thing that you'll be doing is bursting through her delusions because this man has told her several times that he does not want her. And because she's so desperate and can't let go, she's hurting herself. So if you do tell her the truth, you're not at fault. Brittany is allowing herself to be hurt because she will not accept that this man has rejected her. Never let a man tell you more than once that he does not want you. The minute a man tells you that he does not want you, it's time for you to go. Oh! 
<laughs> Shout out to everybody. I have fun. Mixed signals are not a thing. When a man wants you, he wants you. If you're confused, that means he don't want you. So move on to somebody who wants you 100%. And if you're out here moving like Britney, I say this with love, stop it right now. Don't let that man reject you another time. Pick your pride up and move on, okay? I'm saying this with love. So now it's the day of the trip. It's four in the morning. We see everybody getting ready to board the private plane, except for Mary because she's flying solo. She's not trying to fly with all of them. So anyhow, Things are a bit tense between Bronwyn and Lisa because Bronwyn is still pissed at Lisa for not defending her the other day at the ropes course. So Bronwyn says that she's still hurt because her and Lisa have been friends for years and the fact that Lisa did not defend her really pissed her off. And I get it because the way Heather came after her, it was a lot. And I do feel like Lisa is silent when somebody else is getting attacked. But when she's getting attacked, she wants everybody to ride for her. And now Bronwyn says that she feels uncomfortable going on a trip with Lisa's friends when she's not even speaking to Lisa right now. So now we see Meredith arrive and everybody's shocked, especially Whitney, because we remember how in episode two, Meredith was out there saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to go, but I'll let you know later. But we do see that a few days ago, Meredith did reach out to Whitney via text and she told her that she had to move some things around, but she will be on the trip. Now, Meredith, I love you down, but you were not fooling anybody because if you miss out on these cast trips, that's a loss of money. So I didn't believe all that when you said, oh, well, I don't know if I'm going to go. I said, girl, you'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> so now we see the ladies land in Milwaukee and now we see that Mary has also landed and she arrives at the hotel first and we find out from Mary that her father lived down the street from Jeffrey Dahmer and he was there the week after he was arrested. So she says that that's her connection to Milwaukee. Now, was I surprised to hear this? No, because it's Mary Cosby, it's to be expected. And Mary Cosby has such a wild upbringing that nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> now I'm all for overpacking on a trip, but Mary packed about two weeks worth of clothes for a two day trip. And I could not stop screaming because the way she was struggling to get in the door, <laughs> So the rest of the women arrive, Mary greets them, she's in a great mood, and now we have the owner of the hotel come out to take them to their rooms. Now I have to say it was a cute boutique hotel and their rooms were all stunning. So there was a nice spread for all of them. Y'all know that my mouth was watering and yes, I am about to order some Uber Eats the minute I'm done filming this. <laughs> One of y'all asked me the other day if I ever cook because I'm always talking about ordering out. I do cook sometimes, but my thing is, if I spend all day filming and editing, I don't have the energy or the bandwidth to make a meal. So I want takeout. <laughs> and with this jam-packed housewife schedule, you can imagine. <laughs> So as they're sitting down eating, we learn some more about the newest friend of the show, Maylee, and we know that she came on through Whitney. We find out that she has four kids, and this has been one of her first girls trips in a long time. And now the conversation turns to Lisa, because Brittany goes on to ask, how is Jack doing? We know that Jack is her oldest son and he's currently on a missionary trip in Colombia. So we find out from Lisa that Jack has been having some health problems as of late and she gets emotional. Now, I loved how the group rallied around her. I thought it was really touching because at one point, Mary gets up to give her a hug. She's like, Lisa, we're all praying for you. And Lisa's like, I'm not trying to get emotional, okay? Like, I don't wanna talk about it. I'm sorry, but it's just a lot right now. So Mary says, girl, it's fine. You're normal. It's okay to have emotions. And I said, Mary Cosby, is that you? The way Mary was so cold in the earlier seasons and now to see her be so warm and comforting and gentle. I said, Mary, I am loving this side of you. Keep it up. I didn't know that Mary had this in her. But we cut to Lisa's confessional and she shares with us that Jack has been in Columbia for the last eight months, but the other night he felt a sharp pain in his stomach. So Meredith wants to know, 
because of health issues, are they allowed to fly out to see him? So Lisa says, oh yeah, when it comes to health stuff, of course, and I was about to book a flight and see him, but he told me no, he wants to figure it out himself. So now Whitney interjects and she lets them know the itinerary for the day. So since they just got there, she's going to split everybody up into two groups. She's going to have some people go with her to the Bobblehead Museum and the others can go to the casino. So Heather loves to gamble. So Heather, Lisa, Meredith, Angie K, and Brittany are all going to go to the casino and then everybody else is going to join Whitney at the Bobblehead Museum. So Whitney also reminds them that later on in the evening, they're going to the Milwaukee Bucks game and they're going to be in a suite. Now, let me just tell you, there is nothing like going to a game and sitting up in one of the suites, okay? The experience is chef's kiss. And courtside is also that girl. Both are phenomenal, but something about sitting in one of the suites, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now everybody goes to their rooms to get ready and when I tell y'all the way I hit the floor when we saw Mary in her room and her son called her up talking about oh can I get $60 and even Mary said are you serious you can't even call me to make sure that I got here safely you're calling me up for money Mary I say this with love your son needs to get a job because sitting there in the house all day that's not fun even if he's working at Chick-fil-A or I think they also put it in and out in Utah work at one of the fast food places he just needs to be up and out and about doing something because just sitting there and spending your mom's money that's not fulfilling we do see Bronwyn in her room she's getting glammed up and Angie K comes in and Angie K does does point out that she's noticed the tension between Bronwyn and Lisa and she wants to find out the tea. So Bronwyn tells Angie that she's furious with Lisa because they've been friends for a long time and Angie says yeah I noticed I could sense the silence on Lisa's part but I have to say that I'm going through it too because we met up for lunch the other day and she just walked out. So here's where things get messy. Bronwyn brings up what Lisa was saying behind Maylee's back. Production plays the clips back from the first episode when Lisa, Bronwyn, and Heather went on that Wendy's run and Lisa was laughing and making fun of Maylee. So she's like, oh yeah, I don't want to be a bitch, but my party planner Wade was telling me that Maylee is about to be blacklisted from Nordstrom because she returns everything. I said, damn. Now, obviously, if she's returning everything, then that indicates that there might be some money issues. And if you know that, Lisa, if that's your friend, then why would you laugh at her? I said, that's so messed up. So Bronwyn points out the hypocrisy of how Lisa and Heather are allowed to run off at the mouth and talk about other people, but then they want to label her as the big shit talker when that's not the case. They're all petty. And she's right. Everybody in this group runs their mouth, talks behind each other's backs. So for them to act like Bronwyn is a troublemaker and Two-Face, no, that's not true at all. Because in my opinion, Heather has always been one of the messiest people on this cast. And Heather is very Two-Faced, if you ask me, along with a people pleaser, and a brown noser. So when she went off on Bronwyn like that in episode two, it was like, girl, stop, because you run off at the mouth too, sis. So Bronwyn continues on and says that she refuses to allow Heather or Lisa treat her like she's their bitch. Then she says she's not trying to throw Lisa under the bus. She's just turning the bus on. <laughs> so now we jump to Whitney in Heather's room and Whitney wants to find out what's the deal between Heather and Bronwyn. So Heather says, well, at the airport earlier this morning, Bronwyn was a bit cold towards me. I'm just trying to feel her out. I said, Heather, the way you laid into her in the last episode, how else do you think she would act towards you? Let's use our brains here. Also, Heather, I wanted to stop for a minute because I think it's weird that you have this hard on for trying to out Bronwyn as a troublemaker, it feels like you're threatened by Bronwyn. And I suspect that you look at Bronwyn as competition when it comes to getting close to Lisa. Because since Bronwyn and Lisa used to be good friends, and now you're finally getting your wish to be Lisa's number one, I feel like you look at Bronwyn as your competition 
and that's why you don't like her. Because I just find it strange that you keep saying, oh, I don't know about Bronwyn and she seems fake to me. It's like, girl, nobody's faker than you. You don't have a leg to stand on when you lied for an entire year and a half about who gave you that black eye. You were sitting up there telling all sorts of tales about how you got so drunk and you accidentally hit your eye on the faucet when you were washing your face. I mean, girl, you have more stories than a comic book. And you finally came clean last season. At the tail end, I might add. So please miss me with all this stuff about how you feel like Bronwyn is a liar and you don't trust her. Because girl, you lied for a whole year and a half. I'm just not here for Heather trying to manufacture this beef with her and Bronwyn. And that's why at the end of this episode, Bronwyn ate you and Lisa all the way up. So now it's time for the activities. We see both groups separate. We start off with Heather, Lisa, Angie K, Brittany and Meredith at the casino. So they start off with roulette. And may I tell you, Every time I see a casino, I always think about my grandmother because she loved going to Atlantic City. I mean, she loved the casino. And occasionally I'll play if I'm in Vegas or if I'm out and about, there's a casino around, it's fun. I'll get the itch sometimes to gamble, see if I can win something. <laughs> so I was living for this scene. But we see Lisa in her confessional and she says, the Mormon church is against anything that's addictive. So gambling, drugs, porn, and one time I was on this flight coming back from New York, going back to Utah, and I was sitting right next to this teenage boy who was looking at porn for the entire four hours. <laughs> so my first thought was he was watching porn for the entire flight, and I know that had to be uncomfortable. <laughs> That's a mess. Now, if you're the type to look at porn or whatever in public, invest in a privacy screen. And privacy screens are cheap. They're like $8 on Amazon. Get you one. <laughs> so now Lisa continues on by saying that she gambles, but she's not addicted to it. And she's Mormon 2.0. So as they're gambling, having fun, Brittany is being a complete buzzkill. She is on her phone texting, double texting, triple texting this man who is not her man. They were all like, girl, if you don't put that phone away, you're out with your girls, have fun. It's really concerning and sad to see grown ass women in their 40s and 50s still boy crazy. And Brittany, are you not embarrassed to show this man? and the world how desperate you are, you are aware that your desperation over Jared is scaring off potential suitors because they see your desperation and they're like, oh, I'm good. I'm good off of her. She's desperate and crazy and obsessive. So we do see that Jared called her back at some point. And now Lisa says, girl, let me see your phone. So Lisa's like, can I please text him back on your behalf? So Lisa does it and she wrote back something like, hey, I'm out with the girls having fun. I'll call you tomorrow. I said, Lisa, thank you because this desperado over here just doesn't get it. So Lisa says, Brittany, we're over him. And unless he makes a major change, we're off of him, all right? Like, just stop, let's have some fun. Brittany, I really felt sorry for you when you went on to say, I mean, yeah, he did ask me to be his girlfriend. I just said, what is going on? Is everything all right? He did not ask you to be his girlfriend. He did not ask you to be his woman. You're not his fiance. You're not engaged. You are nothing but a friend to this man. And even Lisa was tired because she just looked at you and kept on playing. I said, that's right, because you can't get through to people who are desperate and in their delusions. So while they're playing roulette, we see Heather and Meredith walk over to the bar to order tequila shots for everybody. So as they're waiting for the shots, Heather says that she's so happy that Meredith decided to come on the trip and that Whitney told her earlier this morning that Meredith was a bit cold to her. So Heather goes on to say that Whitney felt a type of way when she asked Meredith to bring her caviar on the trip and Meredith was bitchy in Whitney's opinion because she said, I was going to do that anyway. So now Heather goes on to add that Whitney was trying to extend an olive branch by having Meredith bring her caviar for the group and Meredith is not trying to hear it. She's like, really, an olive branch? A better olive branch would have been if she apologized for treating me poorly last year. So now Meredith says that a lot of things are not adding up for her. And now she spills some tea 
about Whitney's business. And we don't discuss this enough, but when Meredith gets angry, she really will try to destroy you. <laughs> So according to the social media streets, Meredith says that she heard that Whitney is using Alibaba designs and jacking up the price. <laughs> I said, not Alibaba. I love the way she talks. <laughs> One thing about Heather, Heather lives for some bad news about somebody else. So she was salivating at this tea. She's like, oh my gosh, this is the kiss of death for somebody's business and somebody's out to get Whitney. Now, a quick side note, if you go on TikTok right now, there's a group of women who live in Utah who claim that they used to work for Whitney's business and they were fired, I think, a week or two weeks ago, and they're on TikTok threatening to expose Whitney for not paying them, and allegedly, she's running a pyramid scheme. So I just said, oh, but Whitney, I hope that's not true for your case, and if it is true, you better pay those women. So Heather is just chomping at the bit. She's like, oh, but are you going to tell her? And Meredith says, well, I don't know. It's not my place to say anything. And Heather's like, well, I think that somebody should tell her. I said, Heather, you just want some mess to get started. <laughs> But Meredith says that clearly Whitney does not respect her because if she did, she would have picked up the phone and called her for advice and some help. She goes on to add how she's been in this business for 15 years and she knows a thing or two. Now, Meredith, let's just call a spade a spade. Let's not act like you really care about Whitney's business. You don't, you don't like Whitney. So for you to act like, well, I wish that she would have called me because I would have helped her out as a friend. No, you wouldn't have. You just wanted to spill this tea and get the word out there that Whitney's jewelry is cheap and from Alibaba. <laughs> So of course, Heather is still pressing Meredith to tell Whitney. And Meredith says, look, she has a weird issue with me. I'm not trying to start anything, but it was brought to me on social media and a lot of other people saw it too. So now it's time for the ladies to go to the Milwaukee Bucks game. And I thought it was cute because one of the players on the Bucks is from Greece. And we know that Angie K is Greek as well. So she had on her Greek jersey, like she was ready. So anyhow, they head up to the suite and the food in the suite, mm, 10 out of 10. And this spread was no exception. They had lobster corn dogs, cheeseburger sliders, hot dogs. My mouth was salivating yet again. <laughs> If the housewives should ever go away, and I can see it on its way out, because let's be for real, we're no longer in the golden era of housewives, but when the day comes, I will gladly turn this channel into a food channel. <laughs> now, as they're all making plays, we see Mary say that she needs to blow her nose. So Angie says, oh, well, I have to use the restroom. Do you want me to bring you back some tissue? Do you want to go with me? And Mary says, oh no, I don't use public restrooms. I have a tampon in to hold in my pee. So Angie was like, wait, what? And even I had to rewind that back. I said, ma'am, what are you talking about? So we learned something new from Mary. Mary reveals that she puts a tampon in every time she goes out to avoid using public restrooms. And she says it works. She says, make sure to get a jumbo tampon because that's what does it. I said, Mary, that's not how that works. And you do know that there's such a thing called toxic shock syndrome. And also holding in your pee isn't healthy either. If you have to go, just go. Mary is something else. And that's an understatement. <laughs> The secondhand embarrassment kept jumping out because while everybody else is having fun watching the game, drinking, eating, enjoying themselves in the suite, Brittany is on FaceTime trying to call this man who doesn't want her. Now, I thought it was iconic that you have Brittany sitting there FaceTiming Jared and Angie K and Bronwyn are standing right next to her talking about her. So Angie's telling Bronwyn about how she feels a bit bad because she found out recently that Jared has been contacting her brow girl and she doesn't know what to do. She's like, I feel bad. I don't want to tell her, but I also want to be a girl's girl and tell her the truth. So Brittany turns around because she knows that they're talking about her and she's like, is this about me? And Angie's like, yeah, it is. 
I don't know how to tell you this, but your man has been in my brow girl's DMs recently. So she shows Britney the screenshots and Britney's like, oh my gosh, when was this? And Angie says, two weeks ago. So Britney, just like you would think, is distraught. And she runs off to the bathroom and Meredith goes with her to console her. And I just said, Brittany, let this be the wake up call that you need, that you are breaking your own heart. This man has told you in so many ways that he don't want you and you keep holding on for dear life. Let this go. And Brittany, when you were in the bathroom, you sounded even more delusional when you said, well, I suspected this. I'm like, girl, suspected what? He let you know that you guys were not together like that. And I love how Meredith said, listen, I know that you're hurt. Better that you find out now than later on. And on top of that, it's time for you to think about yourself, put yourself first, and go on some dates with some other men. Don't worry about Jared. And I said, exactly. So now we cut to everybody else back in the suite. We see Mary and Angie dancing, having fun. And now we cut to Bronwyn and Lisa. So Lisa goes over to Bronwyn and she's like, hey, how was the museum? Did you have fun? And Bronwyn still dry to Lisa. She's like, yeah, girl, it was cool. We have fun. And now we see production show us a clip of earlier on when they were getting ready for the game. And Bronwyn tells Maylee that Lisa was talking about her a few weeks ago. So now we see Maylee walk over to Lisa and Bronwyn and she's like, Lisa, I have a question. How do you like my clothes? Because an hour ago, Bronwyn let me know that you had some stuff to say about what I wear. Lisa is speechless, she's gagged. So she's trying to backtrack. She says, look, it was a sarcastic comment, okay? I was being snarky because somebody said, oh, it looks like Valentino. And I said, no, it's more like Nordstrom. And in true Lisa fashion, when she's the one who's offended somebody, she can't own up to it. So she says, honestly, it's not that deep. And I said, okay, Lisa, for somebody who's so sensitive about what's being said about them, you don't have that same regard about other people and their feelings. And also, Lisa, that's not all you said about Maylee. Bronwyn actually spared you because we saw that clip a few minutes ago where you said not to be a bitch, but I heard that she's about to be blacklisted because she's always returning stuff. And if I were Bronwyn, I would have been petty and I would have told Maylee that she said that too. So now Bronwyn jumps back in and she says, it's funny because when you say something, it's a joke. But when I say it, it's not a joke and it's snarky. Then she goes on to say that if Lisa's messy, then she gets to be messy too. I said, oh, let her know. Bronwyn did not come to play. I was here for all of it because Lisa was speechless. We rarely see Lisa without something to say. And the fact that she sat there and took those licks from Bronwyn, I loved it. <laughs> and Lisa says, you know what, Bronwyn, if you feel like I haven't been there for you as a friend, I'm sorry. Now that's how you know that Lisa was dead wrong because we rarely see Lisa own up and apologize. So the fact that she said, I'm sorry out the gate, that's how you know that Bronwyn is that girl. Cause Bronwyn said, no girl, if you want to be messy and on that BS, then allow me to be on that BS sometimes too. So now you have Lisa making excuses. She's like, it's interesting dynamics. And I had no idea that you had left the ropes course with unresolved feelings. Bronwyn was not here for the excuses because she keeps calling Lisa out. She says, girl, you know good and damn well that you could have defended me when Heather was berating me like that. You could have said, stop, I know Bronwyn. We've been friends for years. That's not her character. But but you didn't do that. The way Bronwyn had Lisa up against the ropes was beautiful because she was not letting up. So now Heather comes over and Bronwyn gets on her immediately. Heather wasn't ready. <laughs> so Bronwyn says, look, Heather, we didn't have that conversation in a vacuum. You were saying stuff and so was Lisa. So you have Heather talking about, oh, I wasn't trying to put you on blast. And Bronwyn says, girl, stop, because you definitely did. Let's not do that. And I said, Heather, you literally said, oh, Bronwyn, you need to watch your words because you're two-faced. And yes, the moment flopped, but you still tried to embarrass her and paint her out to be a liar in front of the group. And I'm not understanding this beef that you have with Bronwyn, it's weird. So now Bronwyn and Heather keep going at it. Heather still maintains that Bronwyn was shading Whitney. And so we have Whitney watching the whole thing go down 
And she says in her confessional that while she appreciates seeing Heather stick up for her, she realizes that Heather still has trust issues from what happened last year with Monica. I don't want to hear anything about Heather having trust issues when she lied to all of y'all and all of us, the viewing audience, about who gave her that black eye for a whole entire year. So miss me with all this stuff about, oh, Heather has trust issues. I don't want to hear that. So Heather really thought that she did her big one because she says, do you think it's cool, Bronwyn, that you say different things to different people? So Bronwyn says, oh, you want to play that game? Because you accused me of laughing at Whitney's trauma, but you and Lisa were in that car telling me how Whitney plays up her trauma for attention. I said, oh, I said, Bronwyn. I said, come through and whack them both. <laughs> I'm just scoot on over and let you whack him. Get him again. Get him for me. Ah. So Bronwyn let it be known that Heather better come to her correct. And then she says, you two are her lying ass friends. We all do this. It's not just me. So child, that's where the episode ends. And when I tell you Bronwyn low key won me over the way she ate Lisa and Heather up, they were both speechless. Both of them were gagged. And I said, exactly. Because what you won't do is sit up here and act like Bronwyn is the source of all the mess when they're the messiest people on this cast, especially Heather. Say what you want about Bronwyn Newport, but she came to play. She has studied the Housewives franchise. She knows how to play the game and she is fully engaged and I'm liking it a lot. I said, oh yes. I think you should worry about your own marriage, Bronwyn. Oh. Oh, snap. I don't have a ton to worry about. How did you and is it, what's your husband's name? Girl, you did not just tell me to worry about my marriage. You don't even know my husband's name. <laughs> so now we open up episode four. It's the next day. Everybody's getting ready for the activities. And we see Bronwyn on the phone with her husband. So he's like, oh, how was the Bucks game? And Bronwyn says, yeah, it was cool. But I had to gather both Lisa and Heather up. And she did that. So she says that she got everything off of her chest. Then she adds that it's unfortunate that her and Heather have gotten off on the wrong foot, but she does hope that they can move forward and have some fun today. So now we have Whitney going into Mary's room to check on her. And it was so funny because Mary was touching up her hair and she was using a hot comb. So when Whitney saw her, she's like, oh my gosh, what is that? And Mary was like, look, I don't have time to explain this to you, but it's for black girls, okay? <laughs> so Whitney's giving Mary the rundown of the day and when I tell you Whitney did a nice job planning this trip because they're doing a lot of cool things. We learned that for their last full day in Milwaukee they're going to start off by going to the Miller Beer Caves where they're going to have a private beer tasting with bread and cheese. Then after that, they're going to have dinner at the Harley Davidson Museum. And then they're going to close it out with the drag show at Trixie Mattel's bar, which Whitney is going to be hosting. So we see Whitney and Mary give each other a hug. You have Mary saying, I love you. And I said, wait, I'm just screaming because we all know that Mary could not stand Whitney. She thought that Whitney was stupid calling her little girl. <laughs> <laughs> then bobblehead last season. So to see Mary do a complete 180 and now she just loves Whitney. I mean, Mary Martha Cosby, you truly amaze me. <laughs> SLC really is that girl because the girls are taking it. Four episodes in, each episode has been chef's kiss. I'm loving the dynamic, the chemistry with the girls. I mean, just flawless. So anyhow, we see Lisa in her room getting glammed up and Meredith comes in to talk to her and Meredith gives her the latest about what happened last night at the game. So she says it was the weirdest thing because in the suite, Angie K and I were talking and Angie K was pretty much saying that Meredith can't trust Lisa and that she should watch her back. And then she also adds that Whitney also joined in on the conversation and pretty much co-signed what Angie K said. So Meredith says that it felt like she was in the twilight zone and Lisa's like, wait, what, what? They said that? 
Are you serious? What? I'm not running to anybody. Whatever I've said, I've said it to their face. Well, no, that's not all the way true because you were talking about Maylee returning her clothes. So don't act like you've always been direct because you haven't. You've been shady too, sis. So Lisa is livid. She goes on to say, I just can't believe this. For them to say that I'm not trustworthy. Are you serious? I'm completely shocked right now. This is a problem for me. And Lisa points out how Angie K and Whitney me are both trying to mess up their friendship. So now Whitney's in Heather's room. Heather gives Whitney a monogram shirt and she says that they're Laverne and Shirley. So as they're hugging and talking about the day and how excited they are, we cut to Heather's confessional and she says that she feels torn right now because she's still thinking about what Meredith told her about Whitney's business. And she just hopes that somebody will say something. I said one thing about it, Heather, you are always chomping at the bit to deliver some news, especially some bad news. Why are you so concerned? This doesn't involve you. So why do you care so much? And it almost feels like you want Whitney to find this out because you keep talking about it. Let this go. On one hand, you don't want to ruin the trip by bringing this up, but then you keep saying, well, I just hope that Meredith tells her for what? You already know that once this gets out, Whitney's going to be pissed and the whole mood of the trip is going to change. And now we see Whitney go into Lisa's room and Lisa is pissed. So Whitney's like, hey, we're gonna be heading out soon to go to the Miller Beer Caves. And Lisa's like, oh, like what? Like what's that? And Whitney's like, Miller Beer, we're gonna have a private tasting. So Lisa's like, oh, I don't wanna do that. I wanna do something else. So I'll meet you guys for dinner. So Whitney's like, girl, are you serious? This is my trip. I planned this for all of us. What are you talking about? And Lisa's like, yeah, I'm not going. So clearly Lisa is mad about something, but Whitney doesn't know what. And I said, now Whitney, this all could have been avoided had you not jumped into the conversation trying to mess up Meredith and Lisa's friendship in the first place. But we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. So now we see everybody on the Sprinter van. They're on their way to the Miller Beer Caves, except for Lisa, Brittany, and Maylee. So Bronwyn's like, where's everybody else? And Whitney's like, oh yeah, when I went into Lisa's room, she told me that she wasn't coming. And now Bronwyn jumps in and says, last night I told Lisa that she was not being a good friend to me. So maybe that's why she's not here today because she's mad at me. And now Angie K jumps in and says, well, me and Lisa are also on the outs too. So Whitney's not sure about those being the reasons. And now she turns to Meredith and she's like, Meredith, by any chance, did you run and tell Lisa what me and Angie K said last night to you about Lisa? And Meredith owns it. She says, yeah. Yeah, I did. Because me and Lisa have a new policy that if we ever feel like something's coming in between our friendship, we talk about it directly. And I told her what you guys told me. So Whitney's like, oh, okay, that's the reason why. And again, Whitney, I don't know what you thought was going to happen. You already know that you and Meredith don't get along. You're also on the outs with Lisa. So what made you think that you could talk badly about Lisa to Meredith of all people? and Meredith would not go back and tell her friend Lisa. Let's use our brain here. So they get to the Miller Beer Caves, and I have to say, it was really cool. I don't drink beer, I don't like beer, but this whole tasting had me a bit intrigued. I loved how the expert started off with, I think it was the Miller High Life, and he said that it's the champagne of beers. So Mary instantly got excited, and she was like, oh my gosh, it's actually good. I never knew that beer could be so regal. <laughs> But I really enjoyed this scene because they were having a good time. The cheese and bread looked good. The different beers. Mary was enjoying all of them. I said, look at Mary drinking beer. Who would have thought? <laughs> we see a parallel scene with Lisa, Maylee, and Brittany. They're going curling. I would have been pissed to have gone curling over the Miller Beer Cave because the curling did not look fun at all. And even the curling instructor was like, oh, you chose to do this over go to the Miller Beer Caves? Like the Miller Beer Caves is one of the most popular activities in Milwaukee. And Lisa felt so dumb. She was like, oh, really? <laughs> I said, girl, it's too late now. You're here to play some curling. So you might as well strap your ice skates on and have at it. <laughs> <laughs> so now they take a break and Brittany is still talking about Jared. I said, oh my gosh, you can't help yourself. 
Why did you come on this trip? And the saddest part about it is there are a lot of women like Brittany who are obsessed with men. They cannot go a minute without talking about a man. And those are the same women who complain about not having friends and they're upset when people don't invite them places because they're always talking about a man. And in this case, Brittany is obsessing over a man who does not want her, which makes it even worse. But Brittany says that Jared has been blowing up her phone, leaving her voicemails. And Lisa says, girl, he's being so manipulative. Look at him. He's saying in the text message that you guys were just friends. He doesn't want you. So now Lisa says that Brittany is the typical LDS Mormon girl who was raised to just want a man. And Lisa came through with a word. She was like, you're an amazing girl. You don't need him. Is having a man nice? Yes, but you don't need one to make you feel fulfilled. When it comes to dating, be self-centered. Lisa has the right idea. Stop worrying more about a man than you are about yourself. Put yourself on the pedestal. So we're back at the Miller Lite Caves and now the beer expert, Ben, lets them know that they have some cool ghost stories in the caves and that if they go to the inn, they can hear all about them. So Heather and Whitney stay back. The rest of the women go over to the inn to hear the stories. And Whitney says, it's nice to have some time away from everybody else, just us two. So Heather's like, oh yeah, Laverne and Shirley over here. And then she says, Whitney, this has been a great trip. I'm having so much fun. And now she delivers the bad news. I said, Heather, you couldn't wait. Heather was salivating to tell Whitney about the gossip that Meredith told her the day before. But this is what happens when you don't have a concrete storyline. So Heather starts it off and says, look, Whitney, I've been meaning to talk to you about something and I was talking to Meredith yesterday and she was telling me that people are talking about your business, Prism. So Whitney's like, well, in what way? And Heather says, people are talking about the legitimacy of your business. So Heather lays it out and says, look, here are the rumors. Streets are saying that you're white labeling jewelry from China and marking up the price. So Whitney says, that's really effed up. There's nothing shady about my business. That's a lie. So she goes on to say that she knows about this social media post because her business partner sent it to her. And she says that pretty much this page has been lying on her for quite some time, saying that she gets her pieces from Alibaba and it's not true. She says that she gets her pieces from curated vendors. And then she adds, is Meredith going into the ocean for her caviar? No. So now Whitney says, did Meredith not learn her lesson last year? Didn't she learn to stay out of DMs and documents? So now Whitney goes on this long rant saying that Meredith operates out of gatekeeping and fear, not out of a place of abundance like her. Then she goes on to say that Meredith has never supported any of her business ventures, never come to one event, and she's annoyed. So now Whitney states that if Meredith were a true friend, she would have called her up and told her about this versus going to everybody in the group talking about it. And I said, now Whitney, let's not act like you're not just as messy. Remember how you said that you heard that Lisa was giving BJ's for Utah Jazz tickets and you heard this about Vita Tequila? You've also been shady too. Now that it's your business on Front Street, now you're upset and sad. But when it was other people's businesses and livelihoods, you didn't care. So I don't have too much sympathy for Whitney because she's done the same exact thing to other people. So now you have Heather playing the victim to circumstances that she created. And she's like, I feel like you're pissed at me and please don't say anything. Just wait to talk about it at another time. Don't ruin the trip. And I said, Heather, it's too late for that. If you were so concerned about having a good trip, you would have kept this until you guys went back to Utah. You would not have brought it up now. So now everybody's back at the hotel to get ready for dinner. And now we see them back on the Sprinter van to head to dinner at the Harley Davidson Museum. Now what's really cool about it is the Harley Davidson Museum is shutting down just for them. So anyhow, as they're on their way there, Heather says that it's been a great trip. She's having so much fun. And Whitney says, yeah, it's been a fun trip until I found out that you guys have been talking about my business. So of course it's crickets. Nobody's saying a word. They're all looking around like, who said that? Mary was like, oh Lord. <laughs> Mary is not here for the drama at all. <laughs> so Meredith knows that it's about her and she jumps in and says, I saw it and I felt badly about it. 
So Whitney says, if you felt so bad about it, then why didn't you call me up? So Meredith says, well, clearly you weren't trying to hear my advice and now they go at it. So now Meredith says, you know what, Whitney, I'm not really that worried about your business because I'm too worried about mine. <laughs> <laughs> so they finally pull up to the Harley Davidson Museum and Whitney says, look, I'm a Harley Davidson girl. It's a very special night for me. Can we please put a pin in this and just have fun? So the vice president of Harley Davidson greets them, gives them a tour and the museum is really pretty. They had the whole museum to themselves and then they got to eat dinner there. So they sit down to eat and of course we can't just have a simple, nice dinner, no. Now, mind you, Whitney gets up to give everybody a gift. She gives everybody some of her jewelry. So as she's passing out her jewelry, she says, I wanted to give you guys this earlier, but when I heard what happened, you guys talking about it, I got emotional. So now she sits back down and she addresses Meredith. She's like, Meredith, if you cared so much about me, why didn't you pick up the phone and call me? So Meredith is clear that she was not trying to be shady. She says, I felt badly about it. That's it, that's all. And honestly, Whitney, you're making a bigger deal than it really is because it's not that deep. So now you have Lisa interject. And I said, now Lisa, why are you inserting yourself? This is between Whitney and Meredith. Just sit there and eat your food. I noticed that Lisa always wants to center herself all the time and it's annoying. So Whitney says, Lisa, not right now. This is between me and Meredith. Please stay out of it. So Lisa just can't listen and she's like, listen, Whitney, let me help you out right now because you're making a bigger deal out of this than what it really is. It's not that deep. So now Whitney says, what I'm really pissed off about is you guys talking behind my back about my business. That's called gossip. Now, Whitney, let's not. You are one of the biggest gossips on this show. The way you will twist up somebody's words in a heartbeat. So you're just as guilty as Meredith and Lisa and everybody else on this cast because you do the same thing. These kind of arguments on this cast are always a bit hard to navigate because I'm not on any one person's side because they all do it. Some do it a bit more than others but nobody on this cast is innocent. So now Lisa points out that Whitney did the same exact thing to her the other night when her and Angie K told Meredith that they should watch out for Lisa. So instead of Whitney owning up to that, she goes on to say that Lisa is steamrolling her. So now of course, we can't let an argument go by without Angie K inserting herself. So now Angie K brings up her issues with Lisa, how Lisa has not talked to her since their lunch. So Lisa says, girl, I don't care if you back Whitney, that's fine. But what I'm upset about is you coming in between my friendship with Meredith. And what Angie K and Whitney did the night before was shady. They can't deny that. Going to somebody's friend and saying, hey girl, don't trust her. She's a horrible friend. That is shady. We can all admit that. And one thing that I can't stand is when Lisa starts yelling because Lisa starts screaming at this point. She reminds me of Gina on OC because that's also Gina's go-to move. Angie K is going to always give you a moment, honey, because her and Lisa go back and forth and now she gets up. And I guess she got up out of her chair so fast that the chair fell back. And she starts screaming about how she's been a loyal friend to Lisa and she calls Lisa an effing bitch. So Angie even says that Lisa has kept her up at night. It's been horrible. So Lisa's dismissing Angie and she's like, okay, girl, all right. And then she says that she had called Angie up and told Angie that, that they need a break from each other and how Angie has not been a good friend to her lately. So Angie's hurt hearing that. And then we see her in her confessional and she says that she's been a great friend to Lisa, very loyal. And it's really upsetting to her because Lisa pretty much wants yes men. Now, I thought it was a bit weird when Lisa brought up Angie's daughter, when she was like, oh, okay, go call your daughter Electra like you always do. And we find out that Angie will use her daughter as an excuse to get off the phone with Lisa. So Angie's pissed, she gets emotional, and she says, Lisa, are you serious right now? If I hang up the phone to tend to my daughter, that's because I'm being a responsible parent. So Angie goes on to say that she's on that phone with Lisa from morning, noon, and night. And there have been times where she's lost precious time with her daughter because she's been on the phone with Lisa. And I believe every word. I feel like Lisa is that type of person who demands your undivided attention. She wants you on that phone 
for as long as she wants to run her mouth and hear herself talk. So Angie K goes on to say that her growing up without a mom, that's the reason why she wants to be as present for her daughter. And then she says, Lisa knows that that's a sore spot for me. So for her to say that is a new low. And Lisa, you sound ridiculous to be upset that she wants to spend time with her daughter and not be on the phone with you 24 seven listening to you. So now Mary interjects and she's like, all right guys, that's enough. You guys love each other and everybody's quiet. So now Brittany interjects and you already know that it's about to be some stupidity about this man. So she's like, guys, I have an announcement. Mary was like, oh Lord, here we go again. <laughs> So she says, Jared and I have officially broken up. I said, what do you mean officially broken up? You can't break up when you guys were not together. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is what desperation looks and sounds like. If you find yourself exhibiting desperate behaviors, stop. So she goes on to say that she had this epiphany and Heather was like, girl, what epiphany? We've heard this before. And Brittany, it's not an epiphany if somebody has repeatedly rejected you. That's you finally getting it through your head that they don't want you. So Brittany says that their advice to her last night was really impactful. And Mary interjects. She's like, really? I didn't think that you were listening. So Mary's like, look, I give it another five minutes before they're back together. So now Bronwyn's like, what's so special about this man? So now Heather jumps in and she says, it's because he's an Osmond. So Brittany starts laughing and Heather says, girl, when that man walks in the room, he leads with being an Osmond. He lives on Osmond Lane. I said, oh my gosh, they have a street named after them. <laughs> <laughs> and we find out from Lisa that Osmond Lane is a gated community, very wealthy, pretty houses, and it was a huge status symbol in the 90s. So they're all joking around with Britney, and now Bronwyn keeps pressing Britney, and she's like, do you love him, or do you love the fact that he's an Osmond? And the way that struck a nerve, because Britney snaps. She's like, you know what, Bronwyn? You need to worry about your husband and your marriage. What's his name again? So they're all like, wait, what? Like, damn. So Brittany goes on to say how every relationship has problems and is messy. And I said, once again, what you fail to realize is you are not in a relationship. That's not your man. <laughs> what is not clicking? He don't want you. <laughs> So Bronwyn is super caught off guard and now she goes into the whole story of how she met her husband, Todd. So Brittany's like, okay, cute, that's a cool story, but did you get with him because of his money? So now Bronwyn is really taken aback and she's like, oh yeah, of course, I got with him because of his money. She's being sarcastic, but she's clearly upset. So Brittany takes it even further. She's like, so what's the age gap between you guys? So Bronwyn says 26 years between us, and Brittany's like, oh wow, are you attracted to your husband? So that really sent Bronwyn off. She was just like, excuse me? Are you asking me that question for real? So now we cut to Bronwyn's confessional and she's like, that's such a weak ass read. At least read me about my third nose job. Then I'd be like, okay, this bitch really came out to play. But to read me about, am I with him for the money? Am I attracted to him? Like, really? So Bronwyn says, here's the deal. When I met Todd, I was working in finance myself. And yes, I am attracted to my husband physically, mentally, and spiritually. And also, if we divorce tomorrow, I wouldn't even get half of his assets. So then she goes on to add that they don't have a prenup. So she says, despite that, even if they did split up, she would still be respectful and fair in the divorce and wouldn't take him to the cleaners. I said, girl, stop. Everybody always says that. And girl, you hit the jackpot because Todd has a coin and there's no prenup involved. You did that. Now, when it comes to this argument with Brittany and Bronwyn, I saw a lot of opinions that were split down the middle. On Twitter, half of y'all felt like Brittany was in the right and that she cleared Bronwyn. And the other half felt like Bronwyn won the fight and Brittany was out of line for even coming at her like that. And my thing is, I enjoyed this little back and forth between them. I thought it was funny. Bronwyn served up some shade when she asked, are you with him because he's an Osman? 
And Brittany shaded her right back and said, well, girl, are you with your man for money? But the difference is, Brittany, you are at a disadvantage because Bronwyn is married and you are not even in a relationship. That's not even on some pick me stuff like, oh, she don't have a man. No, I'm just saying she's in a relationship in her mind because this man has told her repeatedly that he doesn't want her. So Brittany getting bent out of shape was a little bit out of left field because you're doing all of this over a man who has rejected you repeatedly. You are this man's friend and you're sitting up here pretending like you're his girlfriend when you're not. But all in all, I thought that this argument was funny. Brittany and Bronwyn both shaded and I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all gagged about the no prenup part because Heather was like, wait a second, you don't have a prenup? So now Meredith jumps in and she's like, guys, let's not talk about that. That's personal information. That's her business. Let's not. So now we find out from Meredith that when her and Seth were on the rocks, they got a post up. Now I feel like they did that because I think that Meredith makes more than Seth. Between the show, her jewelry line, which is doing really well, her caviar line, she has a lot going on. So I think that she got that post up to protect her assets. So that way Seth won't have his hand out if they should ever split. And smart woman, if that is the case, because you guys know how I feel about women giving men money. Absolutely not. But we cut to Whitney's confessional and she says that she doesn't like how Britney's trying to accuse Bronwyn of being a gold digger because people accused her of the same thing when she got with her husband, Justin, because there's an age gap with them too. Justin is 18 years older than Whitney. So she goes on to say how it's also really annoying because people who judge are the people who want your situation. But dinner is over and now it's time for them to head on over to Trixie Mattel's drag bar for the drag show. And that's where we end the episode. Now, I was really disappointed that we only saw 30 seconds of them at the drag bar. I feel like the drag show deserved a lot more screen time, especially since that was the sole purpose of going to Milwaukee in the first place. Did anybody else feel like we were cheated out of seeing them at the drag show? I know it's not just me, but y'all, that was the episode and that was my double recap. And when I tell you all that SLC is giving what the other girls were supposed to have gave in the words of the iconic Rolling Ray, they did that. But y'all, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening on the podcast and you already know what to do. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and I will see you all later. Bye.